experience with the National Commission is something you've described as a kind of postgraduate education of a physician into ethics. Um, how much of that did you get from people on the staff, and how much did you get from people on the commission, and how much from the wider world of, of research ethics? I think that I picked up a lot uh, from the people on the staff, uh, in particular from the philosophers that were connected to the staff and from the lawyers. Tom Beecham, to a much greater extent than Stephen Toulmin, Tom was always much more willing to talk about the uh, practical applications of, of things. I learned a lot from John Robertson, uh, although, as it turned out, I had to end up not agreeing with him on some points, but I still learned an awful lot about what, what it looked like to get things into the law. And then from the commissioners, I learned mostly from Karen Labax, an awful lot from David Lewisell. Uh, I mentioned in the first of our sessions that he was my favorite teacher among those that were connected with the commission. Uh, I learned a lot from Albert, uh, Al Johnson. Uh, Donald Selden, even though he's an internal medicine specialist, he still uh, was richly read in uh, philosophy and uh, guided me through some points. The main education, Alex, was yeah. uh, uh, they asked me to write their background theoretical essays. And so I wrote best I could. And then what they did is they sent them out to uh, a who's who of experts in the field, uh, surgeons, psychiatrists, lawyers, uh, all sorts of folks. And uh, they then would criticize uh, my writing. They would say, this is good, this is bad, this could use improvement. And uh, this was like having uh, a nationwide dissertation committee leading me through my education in the field. And I have often said that this was the uh, most positive uh, educational experience I could imagine for somebody who was new to the field of research ethics. A number of the other commissioners were not uh, philosophers or lawyers. Mm -hmm. They were physicians. And as an observer, you, you, of them and their education, to what extent do you think they also um, really took in the ethics side of things? I mean, you became a person who had a career then in research ethics on top of your career in internal medicine. Um, and you say Donald Selden had, as a, an example, one of them had a background in philosophy, but I'm curious, uh, you were at all the commission meetings, I guess, you, you, you saw them mature in their, their views. Sometimes people do, who do that are just coming to have faith in their staff and they can nod and agree and maybe make a few comments. And other times they get in to the subject as deeply as the staff and have their own, in effect, postgraduate education. Can you can you talk a little about the dynamics on, on the commission and any maturation or change of thought process? All right. There were only three physicians on the commission, but and three scientists uh, weren't there. Joe Brady was a psychologist, a radical behaviorist. Uh, Elliot Steller was a physiological psychologist. Um, I think there was... Ken Ryan was a... Well, no, I'm, I'm naming the two oh, scientists who were not physicians. Ken Ryan was OBGYN. I would say he had perhaps the most... Uh, he was most astute among them of applying 
uh, the insights from philosophy and law to uh, the practical experience of uh, doing research involving human subjects. Donald Selden didn't have a background in philosophy. It's just that while he was a medical student, he spent uh, a lot of time reading philosophy while the others were reading about uh, biochemistry and physiology and so on, which he was already very uh, learned in. And uh, Bob Cook was a pediatrician. And Bob Cook came to the table with a lot of uh, uh, fairly firm ideas on what it was right and wrong to do, particularly in research involving children. And I didn't notice that he changed very much in the course of the commission. What were his views on right and wrong? Were they religiously based or uh, based he, as being? From he did not. Field. He did not explicitly appeal to a religious basis for his positions, but they sounded, uh, in many respects, indistinguishable from uh, some theologically based positions. And uh, that's about all I can say right. about that. Now, conversely, the people who were coming from the more philosophical background, like Karen Labax or David Lewis uh, from law, uh, they didn't know medicine when they started. Was, was that remedied in the process? Did they? Uh, well, no, I wouldn't be that. David Lewis L. came into this having written that uh, uh, magnum opus on medical malpractice law. And he was really very learned about the intricacies of what can go wrong in medical practice. And he picked up the research context uh, pretty well, pretty quickly. Uh, Al Johnson had spent many years making rounds in San Francisco General and Moffitt Hospital in San Francisco. And he was pretty well versed in the lingo of uh, clinical ward rounds. He already had some IRB experience. Karen Labax uh, was just very she did her dissertation on uh, abortion, uh, mainly a radical critique of everything that had ever been written about the morality of abortion, and never coming to any conclusion. But uh, most of her readers saw her as being anti-abortion. Mainly it's because she showed what was wrong with the papers that were written on the other side. But they didn't notice so well that she also critiqued those that were on, on the anti-abortion side as well, on the abortion side as well. Uh, so I, I saw each of them, you know, came prepared in a certain way. Uh, Bob Turtle did not seem to move very much uh, with the passage of time. And unfortunately, he died. Uh, during the court, as did David Lewis. So, uh, two out of our three lawyers died. And Pat King uh, really was not uh, precisely on the research ethics track as much as she was on the uh, civil rights, privacy uh, type of track. Had about some, oh, and Dorothy Height. Dorothy Height was a very wise lady. She was called the public representative. She just sat through the meetings knitting or tatting or embroidering and almost never said much of anything. But when she did, it was usually very well, very, it showed very clearly that she was listening. Yeah. Once the commission had come to an end, um, you were apparently determined that the work you were doing there is something that should become a big part of your life's work. I think during the third year, I went to uh, join the commission uh, as a special consultant, thinking that I was going to spend a couple of years defending my profession. And then I gradually came to realize that this so-called defense of my profession was becoming my profession. And uh, I didn't look at it so much as a defense anymore as it was uh, trying to uh, put it on the right footing. I was always interested in striking a balance between the uh, 
uh, requirements of ethics and the requirements of science. And some of my early work had a lot to do with clarification. In fact, the main paper I wrote for the Hastings Center report was called Clarifying the Concepts of Research Ethics, in which I pointed out, and you'll find this familiar, that the first uh, thing it had to defeat was the distinction between therapeutic and non-therapeutic research, which had so distorted the field for years. Uh, next thing it had to get rid of was the idea that research was a very risky business. I was able to point out that it was uh, substantially less risky to be a research subject with a certain disorder in an institution where you were a research subject than it was to be a patient in the same institution with the same disorder and not being a research subject. And was that something at the time for which you had uh, statistical evidence? The statistical evidence developed uh, during my first year uh, associated with the commission. In 1975, we saw the report of the HEW Secretary's Task Force on Compensation for uh, Research-Induced Injury, and they very clearly documented that. Yeah. When I said that it was moving on to make this part, a big part of your career, I was thinking of the founding of the journal IRB, which yeah. was founded about 1978, which is the year the commission ended, I think. Um, the first and, issue was March 79. Uh, March 79, Your okay. timing is almost perfect. So to me, that was an indication that you saw this as an important field in which you would be uh, obviously very well equipped to contribute a lot, and it also drew on your background uh, as an editor, or previously yeah. being an editor of clinical research. Um, and so, before that, of biochemical pharmacology. Well, well, say yeah. a little bit about that aspect of your work. What, what was your goal with having a journal called IRB? During my editorship of clinical research, which ran until the end of 1975, people in research ethics began to refer to this journal as the uh, Journal of Medical Ethics. There was no other journal in medical ethics at the time. And uh, the, the first one who used that uh, designation was uh, Ken Ryan. And that's because when I took the job as being editor of clinical research, historically it had only been concerned with publishing presidential addresses and other such uh, uh, exercises. And I said, I will take this on condition that I am able to use the narrative portions. See, the, most of the journal was concerned with abstracts of papers to be presented at meetings. I said I wanted the, what I call the prose, as distinguished from the poetry, <laughs> to be concerned with what I then called the social, economic, legal, sociologic uh, uh, ecology of clinical research. And over the first two years, I had sociologists, I had lawyers, and so on. But uh, during the last three years, it was almost all on the ethics of research involving human subjects, which was very much on target with the purpose of the organization. It was the largest uh, organization of uh, people who did research involving human subjects in the country. And then going on to found IRB, was that because you thought uh, the journal clinical research was... It wasn't uh, mine anymore. wasn't yours anymore. You I mean, you we had a five-year term. You, I needed, had, you needed a new venue. That's for what I needed. But also, more importantly, I got together with Bob Veach, and Bob Veach uh, uh, brought Tom Shannon in on the conversation. And we sat down and agreed to uh, found a journal in the field. And uh, I said, part of my vision is that what we need in research ethics is an analogy to what the case law does for the law. Nobody knows what the real cases look like and what an IRB does when it takes on a problematic case. How does it conduct its analysis, essentially writing what would stand as an 
an opinion in, a, in, a, in an appellate uh, decision. And that's what I said, I'm not going to call it common law, I'm going to call it common sense. And uh, that's the term I put into it. The term was suggested to me by Guido Calabresi. Uh, and then we said, okay, we're going to do this thing. We're going to apply for a grant. Uh, uh, and uh, who's going to be the editor? I said, well, which one of you has ever edited anything? And it turned out I was the only one who'd ever been an editor, so I was the editor. <laughs> Say something about what you think the journal has done through the years. Um, I think in the early days we uh, published a lot of very good analytic case studies. We also published a lot of stuff that even um, just two weeks ago I joined this National Research Council uh, Committee on uh, Revision of the Common Law for Social and Behavioral Science. And uh, it came up at the meeting. Uh, has anyone ever seen an article on this? And I said, yeah, I edited a journal where we published that. And so I have had considerable correspondence just putting those papers from the early 1980s out now in front of a new audience. Uh, the case studies, I think, are a very rich resource. Uh, you can take these cases that are focused on a specific issue and generalize from there. Not that I think it's a good idea to overgeneralize, but following the uh, fundamental principles of uh, case law, casuistry, you uh, look at the paradigm case and see if there's some way that it is distinguished from the case in front of you. And if it's not, you can pretty much say, well, how did we handle this last time out? And that's a great contribution, I think, if I may uh, say that my little contribution was great. <laughs> yeah. Does that happen? Do people come in and say, well, there's a case report here and we... No. 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 The case report originates with an individual. Uh, I've never been in an IRB meeting where uh, anyone has articulated before we reviewed the uh, protocol. Now we're going to be building a case report. Well, I meant the other way, that, that someone comes in and says, well, this is very much like a case that was reported in IRB, and oh, we, yeah. we ought to take note of what was said there, just the way a, a court will say, well, yeah, we Another don't... court has decided this case, and that's the common, the common law, maybe the common sense yeah. way of pursuing I don't think it's done with that degree of formality. But uh, while we're sitting in an IRB meeting, somebody might say, hey, I read about a case that looked a little like this in uh, IRB or somewhere. And we'll see if we can tease out anything from that case that's applicable but I think another point that was made well by Al Johnson and Steve Toulman, when they said that the National Commission principles notwithstanding uh, mostly relied on casuistry, I think they're wrong and they're right. Uh, the National Commission never said, uh, let's look back at paradigm cases. On the other hand, just like every other deliberative body that I've ever been part of, uh, they pick up their first clues on how to get into a problem by saying, how did we handle this last time out? Or has anyone had any experience with an issue of this type? And I think that came up repeatedly. Although uh, when they got around to writing their reports and deliberations and conclusions, they were pretty careful to ground almost everything they did in, uh, not so much in a principle, but in a norm that was emerging in order to interpret the application of that principle. You've spent a, your career also as a teacher of medical students. Do you find that a change in medical students' uh, expectations and attitudes towards 
uh, conducting research and what they bring to it on the ethical side from when you were in medical school 50 years ago? Or when I was in medical school, uh, the word ethics almost never came up except <clears throat> when we were discussing the oath of Hippocrates or the AMA Code of Ethics. Uh, the AMA Code of Ethics, when it was first published in, the, in 1847, was a very rich document. Uh, by the time I came along, it was down to uh, a very small document, and by the 1970s it became ten sentences with a big back of the book called Judicial Opinions, where basically uh, the AMA came to a point where they just made broad statements of ethical position and left all the rest of it to their judicial counsel interpreting, but mostly reporting what had been decided in uh, the courts of law. Uh, I don't know of any medical students to this day who spent a lot of time studying the AMA Code of Ethics uh, or the judicial opinions. I do think, though, that the students who are now under the age of 35 are increasingly brought out into the social context through such things as social networking. Um, I think that when I was a medical student, we had perhaps five or six societies of medical students that were devoted to one specialty or another. None of them were devoted to ethics or medical legal or anything like that. Now the students have perhaps 200 little study groups, discussion groups, what have you, of which 30 or 40 of them are uh, touch on legal or human or ethical or humanities connected uh, topics. And when you teach, do you uh, teach students or into the recent past have you taught students about research ethics as yes. part of And is there a change uh, now? You're saying before they didn't know much about uh, the AMA. I mean, they only knew a little bit when you were in medical school, the AMA yeah. smattering. But over time, has this made a difference? I, I, let me elaborate. Partly why I'm asking is that in some ways people say that there's a great deal of pressure today to uh, push the boundaries of research. There's more competition for funding, uh, and therefore people are, are driving harder to get their projects through and so forth. Um, one could expect that that actually means there's more ethical shortcuts and shaving of things because so much the drive to get uh, a project approved and funded and your career built and so forth. Or it could be, well, there wasn't much attention to ethics before. Now people actually are very attentive to it. We've made a difference in the, in the profession, if you see the contrast. Yeah, I, your, your question, Alex, is has many different layers in it. <clears throat> Peel them away. At, let me begin it with your first pass through the uh, field, and that is in my teaching of medical ethics. I began teaching medical ethics uh, at Yale Medical School in 1974. Uh, to a class that was half medical, half law students that was set up uh, because the students came to me and said, we want you to teach us a uh, class in medical legal matters. I said, I don't know anything about it. They said, well, whatever it is you're doing, we want a class in that. I said, I will call it ethics. And I had a wonderful time. It was not 74, 75. And then the following year, the dean of the medical school, who had been doing a course with Margaret Farley, uh, I'll say for the camera, but not for you, that she uh, held the title until a couple of years ago as professor of uh, 
religious ethics, Christian ethics at Yale. Uh, she taught with the dean, and uh, the dean mainly provided case material, and she would do the ethics teaching. And when he left, she took me in as a full partner. And our class was designed for 40 students, half medical, half divinity. And just putting these two categories of people together was an education in itself. Right. And uh, the medical students came in pretty, well, the first year's enough of it. We found that approximately 25% of the medical school class would sign up in this elective course. And we taught it together happily for 13 years. And then the medical school decided it wanted a required course. So uh, they turned to me and Jay Katz to set up the required course. And it was not a success. First, uh, we still had 25% of the class uh, who was interested in medical ethics. And they would come and do the work and do the reading and so on. And secondly, uh, the other 75% of the class just went through the motions. They didn't do the reading, they didn't do the assignments, and at Yale you don't grade anybody. So there was, no, uh, there was neither a carrot nor a stick. Uh, the ones who did the work did some beautiful stuff. A second problem is that Jay had never in his life taught a required course before. And every one of his devoted students was there because he or she wanted to be. And they loved him, and he loved them. And uh, he just, he, it was very heartbreaking to see him trying to cope with the presence of three quarters of a class who didn't want to be there. The other thing is, Jay did something that is absolutely taboo in a medical school. He would hand out a paper and then come to class and say, I want to see you tear it to pieces. Unthinkable that a medical professor would ever give a student something to read that was not the gospel, right? And he said, I want you to tear it to pieces. What kind of a guy is this that he would, was so busy, why does he give us junk to read? And it was too much. <laughs> he quit after two years. And uh, then I... You continued? Uh, mm -hmm. I continued for another two years in partnership with Angela Holder. A lawyer. Uh, a lawyer, right. Uh, unabashedly a lawyer, where Jay was a psychiatrist who most people thought was a lawyer. <laughs> and, uh, and Angela and I did some work together very well, but our teaching styles were not compatible, uh, where I am very methodical and plan everything. I even would stay up late night uh, writing my spontaneous uh, remarks. Angela never prepared anything and would come in and tell, you remember, little Herman stories. And, uh, and so then I pulled out and she brought in an internist who was interested in medical economics, medical insurance, and he teaches that to this day, uh, along with uh, whole squads of people who run the small groups. So I would say the level of interest since the mid-1970s in terms of percentage who were interested is not changing, or did not change during my time teaching in this program. And the guy who teaches now who's interested in uh, economics and insurance issues. This is not teaching ethics. Uh, but people say the course is called professional responsibility, which is the name Jay and I gave it. And so it historically looks like something like ethics. Now, at the other extreme of your question, money is getting scarcer. Competition for the money is getting intense and frankly, detrimental to the well-being of the medical school community. People who used to regard themselves as colleagues are now competitors. Not a healthy atmosphere. Uh, does this mean that they're more attentive to the ethics of what they're doing? Or less? Uh, I would say that there's still largely grumbling about 
we got to do all the science, and now we, on top of that, we got to do this ethics stuff, you know? Give us the easiest ticket you can find for us to get us uh, to the point where the dean will sign off. The dean is under obligation to the NIH not to sign off on a grant application unless the applicant has passed a course. The course takes two hours. I can't teach ethics in two hours. And the course is a, an online course. It's just that sort of NIH. Yeah. Put in your time. Right. And then if you get the answers wrong, they make you take the take it over and over again till you get them right. Does that leave you very discouraged? Back in 1975, when you were with the National Commission, did you think once the Belmont Report, uh, or whatever the report was, it wasn't the Belmont Report yet, but would spell out these ethical rules, that we have some clear statement of the obligations that the profession would really embrace this? Uh, I had flickers of that kind of ambition during the 1970s. But then I saw how, at the very top levels, efforts along these lines were frustrated. I was talking earlier today with our colleague, uh, Cynthia Gomez, about the report the commission put out on research involving prisoners, which I thought was so bad that I criticized it uh, in a publication. But then, as bad as it was, the Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare made it worse by throwing in an interpretation that was drastically at odds with what even the Commission asked for, where it said you could do research on diseases that were peculiar among prisoners. And she said, well, hepatitis, a lot of hepatitis in the prison, you know, a lot of this, a lot of that. and and undermine. And so I quickly realized how people who attempted to learn the ethical underpinnings of our regulations would get frustrated and confused. Uh, and this is an experience that's repeated itself since. The whole field of AIDS was contaminated by the very difficult, the great difficulty in getting access to antiretroviral drugs by the people who needed it most, people who were defined as prisoners and uh, adolescents. The rules for, I mean, according to FDA regulation, if you're doing anything with an investigational new drug, and all the antiretrovirals began that way, you had to go through all these hoops to get it to the people, and most doctors didn't want to do it, and they just said, the hell with it, you know. We'll treat those people we're allowed to treat. And so there were all these frustrations that had nothing to do with the inner core of ethics or ethical reasoning. It had to do with bureaucracy. And so I, I then kind of reeled in my expectations. And uh, uh, I gave a lecture to the Canadian uh, uh, National Association for Postgraduate Medical Education that the purpose of teaching ethics in medical school or in college is never to make people more ethical. That is determined, you know, by the time they're five or six years old. But what it does is it affords an, an aid to those who are fundamentally predisposed to behaving ethically, uh, an aid to figuring out what the ethical things to do are and how they play out in the setting in which they are operating. When we think of the, those basic aids, mm -hmm. certainly one approach is the approach the commission took of stating some principles. And the commission stated three, often now elaborated by breaking down one of them into two parts, but a, a fairly compact. And uh, in your own work with physician who must consult you. They're going to do a research project and they have something that's bothering them. Do you find that that's the approach you take? Uh, no. It, no. No. So how, uh, how would you describe your own, what's the Bob Levine approach to the real problems of research ethics that uh, 
well, there investigators are, have to grapple with, or maybe an IRB would have to grapple with? There are some uh, topics in research ethics that lend themselves very well to aggregation under a principle. I don't see the principles as the driving force. I, uh, you look at the first two editions of Beecham and Childress, uh, you know, the basic uh, medical ethics 101 for students of all sorts, they had a chart which said you begin with ethical theory, ethical principles, ethical norms, and then particular judgments, and there were arrows going down. You would uh, deduce the uh, norm from the principle, the principle from the theory. And then by the, I remember writing Tom a letter of congratulations when in the third edition, the arrows started going both ways, that you could induce from a judgment to a norm, to a principle. And that's the way I've tried to approach it since the beginning. And I've been much more attracted to uh, narrative ethics, to uh, what kind of a story is uh, a good physician trying to tell about his or her life and work. Uh, and is that because that's a, a way of thinking that is closer to the way physicians themselves are reasoning? They're confronted with a case and then they're trying to test the case and its understanding against some, some knowledge about disease and some principles of physiological functioning and so forth, or is it uh, something that's just particularly appropriate to ethical reasoning? I think we're, we're seeing what used to pejoratively be called principalism yielding on a broad front to uh, narratives, to... Uh, to casuistry also? Or? Mm, well, not explicitly to casuistry. Casuistry was given a uh, bad connotation by, uh, you know, the casuists of, uh, <laughs> of the 18th century, right. the 17th century, right. uh, who were selling their judgments. <laughs> yeah, but didn't uh, you mention Steve Tolman and Al Johnson trying to resuscitate, get, resuscitate it? Yeah, I think their book is a, is a lovely book, but it has... You know, for those of us who are interested in scholarship in the area, it's a very attractive book. But uh, I don't think it's captured the popular imagination. Mm -hmm. uh, and it certainly hasn't uh, commanded a, a lot of the commentary on ethics in medicine or in research. Your, your, own Kate, uh, your own book on the ethics and regulation of clinical research, which is one of the basic sources, um, begins with the discussion of, of basic concepts and, and definitions. And one of the ones that you are always strongest on, and you've mentioned it, is uh, the perils of talking about therapeutic research. And one of the perils can just be what I think you've pointed out as kind of the oxymoron. Uh, mm -hmm. Research isn't therapy, so saying therapeutic research is almost a contradiction in terms. But a, a, another one, another aspect uh, of it is that um, that which affected the original declaration of Helsinki, that somehow a total different mindset is appropriate when you're combining care with research um, than when you're doing research on the normal volunteer. And that, in effect, the physician <clears throat> has much more leeway in what he or she does and how it's communicated. And of course, at the outer edges, even whether or not they want to treat it as something they have to go through the whole apparatus of research oversight. Yeah. Um, can you say a little bit about what your, your current view is on this? Uh, because the term is still used by people. Oh, sure. Bob Levine has spent a lifetime trying to get people to uh, 
extirpate the word from their vocabulary. People fall back on it. Can you just The think World Medical Association doesn't use it anymore. Yeah. And no, the World Medical Association long ago in the declaration stopped using that division. Only in the uh, year 2000 revision. It was a long siege. Yeah. Uh, the people who got together uh, to create what came to be known as the Declaration of Helsinki were largely people who had no experience whatever in what moderns would call research. I don't want to get too tangled up in this because I could spend more time than we have, but uh, they hark back to the period of time in art history when uh, drug companies would send doctors in practice a box of free samples, they call them. Try these out on your patients and let us know how you like them. These were short, uh, given the shorthand expression, clinical trials. And when uh, the, in the legislative history, of the National Research Act, you can see that, oh no, in the legislative history of the harris Kefauver Amendments to the FDA Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act in 1962, it's very clear that this is a sort of uh, uh, perspective that, uh, that they were talking about when they set as a standard for uh, establishment of effectiveness uh, adequate and well-controlled trials. In fact, the guy who campaigned against this unfortunate usage uh, at length was Louis Lasagna, one of the very early members of the Primer Board. Uh, the people in the World Medical Association never did appreciate that the whole passage that they wrote on clinical research if you break it out point by point, it's really guidelines for conducting what we in the United States call compassionate use. The doctor shall be free to use anything that in his judgment is most likely to advance the well-being of the patient. The, a descendant of that is the best proven therapeutic method and so on. Uh, this is not at all, and this, I tried to parse this out in my uh, passage that ended up in the Belmont Report where I created a category called non-validated practices. That the idea of giving a remedy or a prevention or something to a patient with the idea of improving his or her well-being, that's therapy. It may not be validated. You may have no evidence to show that it works, but the enterprise is much more related to therapy than it is to research. What the National Commission then said is, if you're doing something that's too much of a departure, you ought to be doing some research to show that it's all you hope it is. And they assigned that to the uh, medical practice committees, et cetera in the institution. And that's the division that I think uh, made sense then and it makes sense to this day. Do you think it is very much followed today? Or? I think when you get uh, in, down at, on the ground in the IRB, they say, here's a trial where they're, com they're evaluating or comparing this cancer chemotherapy with uh, another cancer chemotherapy. There's a special form of justification for those components of the protocol that are therapeutic. What the pediatric regulations call hold out the prospect of direct benefit. You justify them in a very different way than you justify the risks of those interventions that do not hold out the prospect of direct benefit. So with children, for example, you say, you cannot do any of those do not hold out the prospect interventions unless there's only a minor increase over minimal risk 
the procedure is commensurate, you know, all those rules. Whereas with the stuff that's done, interventions or procedures which do hold out the prospect, the justification, there's no ceiling. You just have to have a reasonable expectation of a, you're likely to do a, more good than harm. Do you think that a, a lot of uh, physicians faced with a, a patient as a subject rather than a normal volunteer, uh, it, it, approach it by thinking, well, I want to do benefit and I, I have a reasonable prospect of benefit? Uh, the second paper I wrote for the commission said it's always more difficult for those who are evaluating research to get a careful accounting of the risks or the harms of the research. Every scientist, every physician believes that he or she is going to do a lot of good. They're not lying. You've got to have an attitude like that to get you out of bed in the morning. <laughs> All right? You've got to believe in what you're doing and they would minimize the risks. Can't you believe in it as a scientist without telling yourself that it's going to help the person? I mean, if, if the subject is well informed that it's research and um, not designed as therapy, designed to answer a scientific question, if it answers it, that's the benefit. It's not that simple, Alex. You can say, I am doing research to see whether or not this drug is better than that drug for the treatment of your disease. Now, as I wrote in my first paper for the commission, anytime somebody in a white coat walks up to somebody with an illness and says, I want to do research on something, it's almost impossible for that person to imagine. Which person? The walker-upper or the patient? The patient or research subject, yeah. as the case may be. Almost impossible for that person to imagine that this person in a white coat is not there to bring some benefit. They can't imagine that a doctor would do something that is not overall intended to do more good than harm. I wrote that up. I didn't have the... Uh, perspicacity of Paul Applebaum to label it the therapeutic misconception, or they'd remember my name too. But uh, I guess what I'm, <laughs> what I'm asking you about is uh, the attitude of the researcher, because I'll, I'll tell you, my impression is that it is equally hard for researchers to think of themselves as doing research rather than being therapists. And I think we have data that supports that. that. Yes. That they, just like subjects say in a phase one trial, oh, I'll get benefit out of this, physicians overwhelmingly say the same thing. But that's in distinction to this division you were trying to make in the paper that you described. And I just wonder whether, what's the origin of that? Is it just impossible to ask another human being to do something as a physician for the good of science and, and not believe and not convey to them in some way that belief about benefiting them? In the beginning, before there were data, there was Harry Beecher. I think you quoted him yesterday as saying the best protection for the research subject is the conscience of the physician investigator. What you didn't mention is that in his book, which he wrote a little bit later, he said it is absolutely essential to divide the process of informed consent into two parts. One is the part for patient care, which the physician takes care of, and the other is the part about the research, which somebody else has to take care of. He didn't, excuse me, I misquoted him. He said it had to be divided in two parts. He didn't say which individual would conduct which part. I then wrote in response to him, the only way to make sure you've got 
both of those doctors in the room at the same time you're getting informed consent is to have them both perform or the two types of physicians should be housed in the same body so that the therapeutic instincts of the physician would always be tempering the uh, thirst for knowledge of the researcher. Jay Katz picked up on the same thing. Jay Katz came at it with a psychoanalytic uh, uh, twist, uh, talking about how nearly impossible it is for somebody to believe that he or she uh, is not acting for the benefit of the individual before him. Uh, and then subsequently we do, developed... Do you share that view of Jay's? Uh, yeah. I think that uh, most people who are doing research on people, I'm not talking about basic exercises in physiology. No, no. But... And I'm not talking about radioactive plutonium, you know, or stuff like that. But I'm talking about research where you're trying to establish whether or not a new drug is safe and effective. The doctors who were doing this really believed that they're doing much more good than harm for each individual. Even though if you sit, now sit down and look at the numbers and say, oh yeah, there's a lot of people that um, are getting subjected to more risk of injury. But that's not, the, uh, that's not the persona they carry around with them when they're actually out there doing some work. So, to a certain extent, you'd have to say they're fooling themselves. I, I think that the uh, psychoanalytic approach would, uh, would take it much beyond the, what we commonly call fooling themselves. I mean, you can, the furthest extreme was with Robert J. Lifton's uh, explanation of what the Nazi research physicians did and he came up with a psychoanalytic concept of doubling, uh, how they could uh, believe one thing and something 180 degrees different at different hours of the same day. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the other concepts that you introduced in your, um, in your book on ethics and regulation of clinical research uh, is the practice is practice for the benefit of others? Yeah, and I find that a very useful concept, but I don't see it discussed very often. Have you followed the history of the idea, um, and do you think we there would be circumstances where it ought to be revived, and would that improve our analysis of? clinical research ethics? Unquestionably. But Say uh, a little bit about the concept. The concept is, it's in that book, <clears throat> but it, it was first uh, included in the very first paper I wrote for the National Commission, where I categorized uh, several classes of activities. And practice for the benefit of others held, it, it was not something where there was any doubt as to what the outcome would be, but it was not designed to contribute solely to contribute to the well-being of the individual patient. In fact, vaccination creates a herd immunity. Uh, the example that I was particularly focused on when I wrote that paper was using heavy doses of uh, phenothiazine tranquilizers to quiet down a violent patient so that the rest of the locked ward could get some sleep at night and so that the uh, staff could go about their business. But this was something you do to an individual with the pretty clear knowledge of what the consequences would be of doing it, but it's designed primarily to benefit other people. I, I raise it, obviously, in light of the conversation we were just having, because physicians don't have a problem doing that, for the most part. I mean, they, it's done sometimes with an organ donor from a living uh, donor, organ donation. Mm -hmm. It's done very much with the consent. But yes. sometimes with quarantine, it might be done without consent, 
under a public health statute. Sure. But physicians don't balk at doing it. And yet, it has a resemblance to what we were just talking about um, in that, in each case, someone other than the subject is the object the, of, the, of the benefit involved. Sure. Uh, in one case, it's the benefit of knowledge for a research subject. Here, it's the benefit to the health of other people. Um, and the only difference is the uncertainty that attaches. Um, yeah. it, a standard vaccination or a standard quarantine has a known set of risks and benefits, whereas doing research has something unknown. Um, but doctors don't try to fool themselves uh, in the case of the benefit of others, that they're doing it for the good of the patient, uh, right. in most cases, as you say. I mean, perhaps the <clears throat> unruly patient, uh, unruly prisoner or somebody in a ward uh, benefits from getting a night's sleep and not being loud just the way sure. the other people on the ward benefit from getting some sleep. But for the most part, that's not how it's rationalized. And I just wonder, since I think it's such a, a, a way of illustrating the willingness of physicians to act not just for the benefit of patients. I'm just puzzled as to if you have any insight, since you wrote about it and, and talked about it so well, uh, why it hasn't entered into the analytic framework more. I think that uh, <clears throat> you don't have people getting heavily dosed with tranquilizers to benefit the other inhabitants of the inpatient psychiatric service, except in that inpatient psychiatric service. And I think if you go and sit in on their rounds, uh, which incidentally include both patients and the uh, healthcare professionals, there will be elaborate discussion about the justification of uh, drugging one of them for the benefit of the uh, other people in the unit. Uh, the quarantine is usually not, these days, carried out by practicing physicians. It's more by public health personnel. Uh, in, I guess there's a little bit more quarantine coming back in dealing with such things as multiple drug-resistant tuberculosis, where the practicing physicians are getting involved. But these are mostly tuberculosis uh, specialists. Uh, there are, I think, in the specific context where these practices for the benefit of others are being done, uh, there is some discussion of it. But it's not part of the broad discussion of uh, ethical justifications in medical practice. It appealed to me because so much of the discussion about research ethics had to do with doing something to one individual for the benefit of others who resemble that individual sometime in the future. And it seemed to be an interesting parallel, although the benefit in the practice for the benefit of others would be benefit to those others in the present, not yeah. exclusively the future. Right, right. There certainly is that difference. Um, one of the subjects that has been, I think, very badly handled through the years by the research ethics establishment and by the government is this issue of the compensation of people who have injuries in research. And it's puzzling because it's not inherently the most difficult issue, either conceptually, morally, or practically. But it's basically been stuck in a rule which is very different in the United States than in most other advanced nations, a rule which basically says it's all right to conduct research without making any promise of uh, taking care of or, or taking care of the injuries or the losses suffered by a research subject, as long as you're clear that that's the terms on which the research are going forward. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you can, shed, since you, you've been involved with that issue in your various capacities as advisor and commissions and someone who's written about this for years, 
Do you have an explanation for why this is an issue that's been handled as poorly as it has been? It's uh, bad advice given to and then issued by the insurance industry. They say you are research is essentially a venture into the unknown. That's a very, very dramatic way of uh, putting it. They don't want to be underwriting uh, compensation for an unknown risk, a risk of an, that's unknown in both probability and in magnitude. Even though all of the examples that we have of trials of no-fault compensation, University of Washington at Seattle, their payout over eight years was $5,000. That's because they carefully dissociated the uh, innovative therapy from risk of research-induced injury. The Swedish experience, where they only had three claimants in the entire duration of the program, and as by my reading, two of them were not injured by the research at all. All these experiences show that there's vanishingly small risk, but I think the resistance has always come uh, by those who speak for the insurance industry. So it's not coming out of the uh research community itself. Uh, on the other hand, you can also say that we're not hearing from the research community frustration to the point that they would say uh, to the insurers, figure this out. Look at the evidence that Bob Levine just cited. Uh, get over your, <laughs> your fear. Your actuaries can predict things that are less likely than this. Yeah. Certainly they can do this. In other words, it hasn't been something where the research community says, we need action. If our roles were reversed, Alex, and I were interviewing you, I would ask you to elaborate on the excellent report that the uh, and, uh, National Bio or the President's Commission put out on compensation for research-induced injury. And the examples I gave you of, on Sweden, for example, are from that. Uh, the uh, Washington Seattle experience was came early enough so that I was able to put that in my own papers for the National Commission. Uh, no, you don't hear an outcry from the research community, but you don't hear an outcry from the research community for almost anything in the field of uh, research ethics. On the other hand, I have been members of uh, review committees, data monitoring committees for various clinical trials in, uh, conducted by uh, federal agencies. And sometimes uh, somebody connected, a project officer, will say, well, shouldn't it be compensation for research-induced injury? Look here, the CIOMS, International Ethical Guidelines, say it's a right and the right cannot be waived. And they say, you were right and you wrote those guidelines or, you know, what about it? And I'll say, you're not going to get to first base with the federal government. The last, or well, one of the ones was the anthrax, uh, post-exposure prophylaxis for anthrax vaccine where CDC lobbied very hard to get compensation, and they were just told, no, we don't do that. So there are little, little pockets of protest here and there. Mm -hmm. Circling back to what we were talking about before, it seems to me that to the extent that a researcher is uncomfortable uh, and wants to tell herself or himself well, I've got to be doing good for this person because they're patient. Um, and, but they're really, if they were honest with themselves, they say, no, this is a research subject, and, and therefore I'm creating some risk to them not for their own benefit. Um, it would be a comfort to be able to say, but if something bad happens, uh, the funds are there to make it as whole as we can make it. And it, so oh, I, 
it would be a way of relieving that psychological distress, but maybe it's not recognized as psychological distress, and instead the person tells himself, uh, well, uh, this is therapeutic research, sure. and uh, therefore it's okay for that reason. Uh, I've, I've picked that out as a sort of a persistent problem that the field has, has not dealt with very well. Could you say what you think of as, as a, a problem which you confronted back in the days of the National Commission that you, you think has not been dealt with well? Uh, are there any? Or are, we, are we past all the big problems? We're now just uh, dealing with education and clearer consent forms and things like that? Well, one thing that gives me some comfort is that since 1975 or 6, all of the exposés of things that look like terrible breaches of research ethics have been exposés of things that actually happened before we had any regulations. The uh, radioisotope experience, there was no case later than 1974. There was the isolated case of uh, surreptitious radiation of some prisoners in 1975, but nothing that came after the uh, promulgation of the uh, revised regulations based upon the Commission's recommendations. The, uh, the most recent uh, entry is this expose of uh, uh, deliberate infection of people in Guatemala with venereal disease. That was done in the 1940s. Uh, and yet, much is made of this in the newspapers. And I see that even Primer is putting highlighting it on its program. And we ought to be highlighting it as a triumph of research ethics. What's come out since 1975 that looks like an egregious breach of uh, ethics? Well, there's been some very bad stories. There was the one stupid. Uh, not, not a deliberate breach of ethics, but uh, 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 exposure to six people in the UK of a phase one drug that it was known could produce a deadly cytokine reaction. And they gave it to all six at once and they all ended up in the ICU that was stupidity. That wasn't a, they, they knew what the rules were. They just didn't follow them. Uh, there have been some other cases of this sort. The Jesse Gelsinger case. Uh, I loved it when uh, our keynote speaker yesterday morning said, well, in response to Gelsinger and uh, the uh, report of the atomic radiation, Human Radiation Experiments Committee. We had to do something, so we endorsed uh, the founding of AHARP. If AHARP worked at an absolute level of bureaucratic perfection, they would not have altered the course of either one of those events one whit. The uh, experience with the Gelsinger boy was done by a guy who was just flat out lied to the IRB and to the FDA about what the results of his early experiments were. Uh, they also got some fairly bad advice by their consultants and uh, consultant in ethics. Uh, the who, who remains nameless. <laughs> not his fault. <laughs> uh, but uh, it was a a reading of the. A, a literal reading of the National Commission report, which was detached from the context in which the uh, uh, that passage was written. 
and the passage being that you should go with the older go, go with, go with a, an older patient who is able to give consent rather right. and the difference just so that uh, I, I make sure that this is what you're addressing the difference is between an older patient who was less sick and a much sicker younger child sure. who couldn't consent um, but, but, but that, what, what, but that what, does highlight the Gelsinker case does highlight Bob the uh, the much greater attention to conflicts of interest, which were not on the agenda of the National Commission or the President's Commission. These were not high-profile issues, were they? Conflicts of interest? Yes. They were aware of it, but, you know, they just said, you got to deal with it. They didn't have a whole report on conflict of interest. My concern now is that the whole field of ethics might be, it's, it, I used to express fear that all we talked about in ethics was informed consent. And now it's getting close to about all we talk about in ethics is conflict of interest. And I'd like to see some balance, mm -hmm. some consent, some conflict, selection of subjects. One of the, the uh, other differences between 1974 and today that people talk about is that back then, uh, because we had less experience with thinking about it, there was obviously a lot of research mm -hmm. going on, but we weren't thinking about the ethics of it very much before then. Um, each case was treated as a case where you had to really look at the ethics. Today, the thought is each case is treated as one where you have to hold up the federal regulations and tick the boxes that are relevant. And so, You've been on IRBs over a 20, 30 year period. Um, is that a false indictment? Do, in your experience, do the ethical issues get as much attention? Or have we gotten to the point, as people criticize, where ethics has been replaced with regulatory compliance? Compliance, bureaucracy, and documentation. I barely suppressed my expression of irritation when a person from uh, the OHRP, Office for Human Research Protection, got up in front of a primer audience and said, if it isn't documented, it never happened. Uh, we have certifying and accrediting agencies who are driving us toward an increasing preoccupation with documentation. Because that's what they can check on? Exactly. I mean, the President's Commission put together uh, teams of experts to go out and look at university hospital IRBs. I was on a few of them. We had uh, Brad Gray, who is uh, sort of team leader, one IRB administrator and one experienced IRB chair that went out and looked at, uh, I think it's five or six IRBs. They then came back and filed reports, and then these reports were contrasted with the results of uh, inspection by an FDA uh, inspector, investigator. The correlation between uh, the assessments of uh, quality of review was almost non-existent. One of the uh, uh, institutions that we came on strongest about criticizing uh, did not have one, what FDA calls, observation made by their investigator. And on the other hand, one that we, uh, you know, on the other hand, the other thing happened. Uh, what this tells me is that people who uh, are experienced with the uh, subtleties, the nuances of IRB review, see, see things that the inexperienced are simply not uh, capable of seeing. They don't know where to look. Uh, we knew that when we had an FDA investigator, they would only want to look at our files. I would invite them to come sit in on an IRB meeting. You'll hear what's, uh, what we really do. 
only one of them ever took us up on it. <laughs> he's, he's the guy who came in and said, I said to him, where did you park? He said, I'm parked in this uh, street. I said, that's uh, no parking area. You, you only have an hour of parking there. He said, we have the advice from the field office that if they, they're not towing in that area, we'd rather play, pay the price of a parking ticket <laughs> than the price of a garage. <laughs> and then as he was leaving, he pocketed a, a sandwich and an apple, mm -hmm. uh, even though he told us he was not allowed to accept food from uh, <laughs> any investigated agency. I mean, uh, there are some disappointments out there. I think our preoccupation with documentation is a great failing. It's almost like our departed friend, Jay Katz um, kept saying, if it were up to him, he would outlaw consent forms. That what you need to have is a conversation. He even went so far as to call it a searching conversation in one of his later books. And no one ever, I mean, we hear lip service. Uh, yeah, we're going to have a good informed consent process. But the only thing that shows up when uh, you get the inspectors out are the documents. Thank you.